Okay, guys, welcome to the BTM Club show. As you know, if you've been following the series, it is about the inspirational people around us in the arts in particular. I know, I know. But as I always say, we don't have to go too far to find our heroes. They're right here with us, walking among us, okay? And we have one today by the name of Her Royal Highness Miss Stacey Haynes. I feel like I, should, I feel like I should bow or something. <laughs> She's just too fabulous. How are you? I'm very good, thank you, Barry. Very, very, very good, and very blessed. Very blessed I, to be here and to be able to speak to you and to be in a position that you know that we are all in and we're all alive and we're all surviving and we're in this crazy, crazy world at the moment. But we're still here. Well, as you say, you know in the crazy world, but we are surviving, are surviving, we're here, and that in itself is a blessing. So, you know, it's lovely to talk to you. Now, when I first met this lady, well, I, I have a feeling that we may have met before, I don't know, mm. but when I first met this lady, she said, you look like so many people in my family. <laughs> I said, really? Maybe it was because it was dark, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> My first thought was, how lucky your family are to look like me. No, not really. <laughs> but um, it then turned out that we have several people in common. Yeah. So I'm sure our paths must have crossed because there was that familiarity acknowledgement when we first saw each other. And then it was like, yeah. So, um. Now, you have had a wonderful career or are having a wonderful career. Thank you. And I would like to know how it started for you, because for me, that is the inspirational thing for other people to see the journey, how it began. And, you know, she is at the top of the tops now, let me tell you. But, you know, it didn't always start there. So, you know, it, it's good to, to hear the backstory, the hustle, and the determination and commitment that has got you to the place that you are now. So how did it start for Stacey Haynes? Where did you grow up? I grew up in South East London, sunny old South East London. I mean, um, I to stop you right there. So much talent is in South East London, let me tell well, you. Okay. yes. Please continue. You. <laughs> we are all here. Um, right. Youngest of six kids. And, um, you know, I always wanted to go to the same school as my sister, which was a lovely private school in Blackheath. And my dad was a diplomat. Was it Blackheath Bluecoats? No, or... Blackheath High, she went to. Blackheath High, okay. And uh, my brothers had gone to Elton Green and Roan and things like that. And then I was like, oh, I want to go to Blackheath High like my sister. But we, our primary school was run by two sisters one was a dance teacher and one was a drama teacher. And my okay. sister and I were their favourites. And we used to do all the little festivals and everything. And the plays, and the school plays. Ten, and, yeah, yeah, the school plays, everything. And at 10, they sent me in for an exam for a school called the Arts Educational School. Oh, Mom right. and dad said, no way, we, we can't afford that. And but but go because the sisters want you to go. So I went and then I got the ILEA grant, which was the Inner London Education Authority grant at the time. Weren't they wonderful days when you oh. could get education for free? I don't really think we realized how lucky we were because you could just go to a college and sign up. You leave your name and address and you start your course tomorrow. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know? and that how the world has turned and Absolutely. the struggle that these children have nowadays is just shocking, yeah. absolutely shocking. So I went for my little audition and did a little bit of tap and a little bit of ballet and a little bit of dance and, and I did a bit of poetry. And then they came back and they said, we'd like to give her eight years tuition free. So you so, must have had some real showing talent already at that young age. Well, there is that. Don't be modest also, now. Don't be modest. No, yeah, okay. But they, <laughs> there was that. And also, I think they were trying to, if I'm honest, they were branching out to get more children of colour into that sector. Right. And um, mum and dad went, oh, hang on a minute. Eight years, free. 
don't have to pay anything. <laughs> You're going. <laughs> I was like, no, I don't want to go all the way to the Barbican. I mean, it was, you know, on your own at 10, this is how much it's changed. On the train, London Bridge, underground, to Moorgate, to Barbican, walk through Spitalfield, and then you end up at school. At school. And that's where I went for eight years. And, wow. Um, so you started at what time in the morning and finished I at what time? I home at 7.30, and I would start school. I'd be, go through the school dates at 8.30, and I would leave the school gates at 3.35, and we'd get home about quarter to five. Wow. From 10. At the age of 10? Yes. Well, I mean, you know, for some people, I guess, as you say, how times have changed, that might sound like a horrific journey for a 10-year-old, but you don't realize the independence that that oh. was giving you and, and training you with already as young as 10. Yes. And by the time, I mean, nowadays I look at my 15-year-old son and I'm like, oh, should he go on the bus today? Um, that, because that's how much it's changed, you know? Yeah. I, there was no thought in my parents' head and in my head. Mum taught me once, this is your journey. To show you the roots. Yeah. Show me the route, then off you go because I'm going the opposite way because I've got to go to work. And right. that was and I came out of there at 18. It was the most fabulous school. It was the most fabulous education and the grounding. I was the only black child there for five years. Right. And 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 it came with its its issues. Challenges, and yeah. Um and that when people go, oh gosh, you know, we haven't moved on. And I go, well, yeah, you have, because when I was 12, I thought I was in the middle of a, a, of an, of a dance piece because I was the best. And the teacher told me quite ca categorically, you're going to make a little chocolate sandwich out of you. And you breathe. And at the time, <laughs> it was like, oh. And the biggest one I remember, and it, again, this is what makes you who you are, I remember we all got our, um, our, our little package for our tap exam. And in our package with our tap exams were our bows for our taps, shoes, a pair of white socks, and a blue leotard. And every other girl had a pair of American tan tights. I didn't have any tights in my package. So I went to the teacher and I was 12 years old. And I remember putting my, and I remember it like it was yesterday, Barry. I put my hand up and I said, oh, I think they forgot my tights out. And she said, no, 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 Stacey. She said, your legs are brown enough. You don't need tights. So I went home to my mum. I went, oh, mum, they, they wouldn't give me tights for my exam. I was devastated. My mother came to the school the next day. She walked straight into the principal's office and she said, you give my daughter a pair of tights right now. So she's like everybody else. I looked like three different people because it was a <laughs> Because they're not your colour. So but that's like not the fun. point. No, that's not I the point. Tights. And, and you we, were entitled to those tights with your exactly. eight years tuition, just as every other child and the, was. And the thing is, now you see the black ballet dancers and they have point shoes that are the right color for them. Yeah. They have tights that are the right color for them. So when people say we haven't moved on, we have. We yeah, really absolutely. have. And theater <laughs> and entertainment has moved. It's still got somewhere to go. Trust me still got somewhere to go you know what everything in life has so, somewhere to go has got room for improvement but exactly. you know there there has been improvement and a forward movement as you say yeah. something as simple as tights that are your color yes shoes that are your color a so now you day. can a band well, yeah. is your color when you're having a strapless dress when you're doing a dance piece and you have a white piece of elastic to hold it up but that white piece of elastic the only way you can make it your color is getting your makeup and putting it on yeah you know if all of those kind of tricks that you had to yes. use just to perform on a, the same professional level as everybody else absolutely you know i've got to paint my bra strap with my foundation uh -huh. <laughs> you know yeah but i guess how did your parents take it that you were going into the arts? Because as you and I know, a lot of West Indian parents aren't so welcoming when it comes to going into the arts. But I figure the fact that you were getting eight years for free made a difference. Exactly. All my cousins <laughs> were lawyers and barristers and all of that. Yeah. That was the way to go. And I was, well, after eight years, 
it, it, it's it's schooling as far as they were concerned. It's not yeah. a career, it's schooling, and therefore off she goes. And I came out at 18, and my first job, because you could not work at, in the West End without having your equity card in those days. In those days. Oh. In those days. And so I took myself off, and I got a, my first job, and I went to Australia for six months to get my equity card. And when I came, mum was like, you're not going, you're not going. I was like, yes, I am. And I went, I waited till I was 18, then I went. And um, it was a, with a, a dancer called Clive Clark, who had won the, listen, He'd won the Disco Dancing Championship. I speak to Clive Clark literally every day. No way! Literally every day. He's always sending me some foolishness. <laughs> and we are laughing away. You see, I know our paths must have crossed, yeah. but not quite crossed. Yeah. You know? So Clive yeah. put together a group of us. There was five of us. And we went to Australia for six months. And we worked in a hotel and we did some sort of crazy show that he choreographed and we danced and we sang and then we came back with our equity cards. And then I worked in a pub for two, a year and a half going, oh, I thought I was going to come back and be. And being swarmed with work and everybody was going, Stacey's back, we can book her. (laughs) And I was like, hmm, I'm working in the pub next door to the Coliseum. That's not exactly what I thought. Yeah, I I think it should be the other way around. I should be working in the Coliseum and coming here for recreation time, not the other. (laughs) Yeah. And then the the, the shows came and um, I did a few shows. Uh, I I wasn't ever tall enough because I'm quite short. So the the TV she shows is a little watching. munchkin. She's a little munchkin. Um, <laughs> so I tried my ha- hardest to be five foot five, but I wasn't. I was five foot two. Um, sometimes they took pity on me, or if they needed that one black girl, one black guy, it back fell to my way. Yeah. But it was literally being in the right place at the right time, and also it's a lot of luck, but it's also going. I know that if I want to get to C, my A and B has to be thought through. I can't just wait for them to all come to me. I have to, I ha- I personally have to be in the right place. Yeah, the actively right place. be. Yes. And I think that's always the case. You kind of have to, to be in the environment of where you want to go. Yes. Because it's those connections within the environment. Because as we all know, it's not always down to talent. You can be the most talented person, but if you know the right person and they like you, they can recommend you, they can push you forward. Yeah. It, it does make the difference to be it in does. the environment. And you yeah. show your worth. I mean, and then when I crossed over from being a dancer to being um, like an assistant and a resident director on shows like Lion King and Smokey Joe's Cafe and Rent and you know I did loads and loads of wonderful shows in the West End it was because there was a choreographer I was working with on Carmen Jones at the Old Vic I was a dance captain and he was lovely but he was he was a very um emotive contemporary choreographer and when he had 52 black people in front of him he was like (laughs) (laughs) what do I do with you (laughs) not sure really not sure and then one day he said, oh, I'm doing the Rocky Horror Show, Stacey, but I can't be there for the first week. Can you help me out? I was like, sure, Stuart, no problem whatsoever. Walked in, the director said, right, so we're going to start with choreography this week. So if you could just get on, Stacey, and do the time walk. And I was like, <laughs> I don't even know what that is. <laughs> Stuart's not here. And he, he, he he's the choreographer. I'm just his assistant. I was just going to be here for a week smiling at people and telling them they were wonderful. But I, I can't put steps together because the time war, what is that? What is the time war? <laughs> and he was like, no, you've got a week, go, go, off you go. Uh-huh. And I made it up and Stuart was so thankful. He then hired me and I ended up doing a fellow movie with him, with Lawrence Fishburne, who is a dear friend and has stayed a friend for 20 years. And I did Kenneth Branagh and I trained him for, so I did some amazing, amazing movies yeah, But that was because it was the right place, right time. I turned around and I said, you know what? I'm not going to run out the door and go, no, I can't do the time walk. I'm going to stand it. there and go, yeah. okay, Stacey, figure it out. There was no Google. There was no, what is this? You know, there was no WhatsApp and no, no. YouTube. Because <laughs> you can get the answer to everything now on YouTube. But exactly. in those days, you know. So it was a case of standing there going, okay, use your brain, figure it out. And, and I did. 
And it's just, you know, the work has come in. I've been very fortunate. I've done TV. You know, but that again is a very, it's a classic example of why you should just face things and do it. Yes. Not be afraid because you could have thought, well, uh, well, I'm the assistant. I'm not really the choreographer. No, you. I'm not going to go and do it while you're away. And yes. then you, you think, well, I'll step over that hurdle. Yes, I will go. And as you say, I'm just going to smile at people. But then, you know, you're confronted with this situation and you go, you could either go, well, you know what? I'm going to front it and pretend that I know what I'm doing <laughs> or I'm going to curl up into a ball and disappear out the door, yep. which, you know, the latter doesn't do you any good. So no, my whole career has been fronting it. My whole career. Well, that's kind of what showbiz is about. But as again, you know, as I said, the tenacity that you have now is kind of going back to when you were 10 and getting on that train Absolutely. and, you know, having to stand up for yourself and, of course, going to Australia at the age of 18. Well, yes. you know, no parents around, no, no no other guardians around. Yeah, you know, all of those things were leading to no tenacious pop. lady. <gasps> I would have had to be back, though. I would have had to come back. I would have been, Clive, it's been a lovely tour. But <laughs> we have to prioritize here, okay? okay. Dance and sing or Pepper Pot Christmas Day. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it was, it was, it was, it's those things, you know, when I did live TV for the first time on the BBC with Graham Norton standing there and I'm a judge and I'm sitting there thinking, yes. and it's all going, and you think, he says, Stacey, what do you think? And you go, and your head is just going, <laughs> you have to get the words out because yeah. you can curl up and go, it was lovely. And that's isn't it this on. what is fantastic? And as they say, it's like when you look at the duck gliding across the, the yeah, exactly. But underneath is all this going on, you know? So you suddenly find yourself on the BBC with Graham Norton, and a panel that's highly regarded, and he's asking your opinion. Inside, you're going, ah! but outside, you have to go, well, I think it was a good effort. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? Their hands could have been more like this rather than like that, you know, and be honest. So the, the film choreography that you did came about from doing that, what was it, moonwalk? Not moonwalk, something walk that you did, that you said yeah. you didn't know what oh, it was. time walk. Time more. All right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that came from that. That came from that. And then I came back and I did more theatre. Right. And then from theatre, I then started, I got asked to do a TV show, Musicality, which was going around the country, finding some uh, unknown hidden talent and putting them in the show Chicago. And then okay. from that, yeah, which was great. It was great. Absolutely great. And then from that, I got two series of um, Strictly Come Dancing spin-off, which was Strictly Dance Fever. Um, and right. Now, I was never quite sure about this Strictly Dance Fever. When did that come about? OK, so that was 15 years ago because my son is 15 and I had him. I was pregnant when I did the second series. It was the BBC decided Strictly was doing terribly well. I think it was, it was in its third year. And they thought second year and they wanted to do a spin-off, but for normal people rather than celebrities. Ah, right. So they took See, this is why it's important to speak to these people that are involved, because there's always a story behind the story. <laughs> and then you realize what it's about. Yes, OK, so, so that was really about just members of the general public. Yes. Having the opportunity to dance do with do each other. That not, yes, not so they were in couples. And right. it was exactly the same as Strictly, but there were no celebrity and there was no professional dancer. Oh, and right. So they were in couples and then they had to do the tango, the waltz, the, you know, the, the, the jive, all of those. And then there was... Foxtrot. Yes. Box myself, Arlene Phillips, Wayne Sleep and Ben Richards were the judges. Right. So Arlene, because Arlene was on Strictly, the original. Time. I knew Arlene very well because I'd done many auditions with her and my second West End show as a dancer was for Arlene. And what was that? It was a show called Time at the Dominion okay. Theatre with Cliff oh. Richard. Yeah, okay. And 
then David Cassidy and Cliff Richard, who I went to see just on Sunday, because how everything goes around. I spent five years with Cliff touring, um, right. which was just, if I had a highlight in my career, there's been many, but working with Cliff was one of the highlights. He is the kindest, nicest, hugest pop star who treated his dancers well. As yeah. We were never in the bus at the back or can you go and get changed down there? And we had friends who were with, you know, all the other directors yeah. who read, all of those. And then, but for one example, we did the Monte Carlo Awards. Steve Agai, Benji, yeah. me. Monte Carlo Awards. There was about eight of us. And we flew from London to Nice and we came out of Nice and there were hundreds of dancers because it was a huge award ceremony in Monte Carlo. And all the there. dancers were being shoved into different coaches, you know, for the hour and a half drive from Nice to Monte Carlo. We came out and there's a little lady there with a little plaque saying Cliff Richard dancers. You know. And I was in charge. I was like, oh, hello, that's us. What, 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 what do we do? I have two helicopters here for you because Cliff does not want you to be on an hour and a half journey because we've got a rehearsal directly when you get there. So he's put you on two helicopters for 15 minute transport so that you'll be fresh and ready and not tired on the one to one. Absolutely. I was there with Kim Appleby doing a duet. No. <laughs> so I know about the helicopter. Yes. Yeah. And it was, and that's the sort of thing, you know, we weren't stuck in the changing room for hours on end. He got us a table. And EMI got us a table and we all sat there. I was in charge. I said, let's That's all right. try. let's sit down. And we were had a table so we could watch the ceremony because we were the last people on and he was the headliner. So we all sat there. We ate and then we went and we got changed. And because of reasons why unknown, we didn't get on till 3.30 a.m. But he was amazing. And he, yeah. he was like that for five years, five years. Yeah. Again, you know, this is why you need to talk to people that really know and not people who have an opinion by what they've heard or what they've yeah. read in a rag or, you know, it's like you need to talk to the people that really know. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then 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 basically it's just it's just happened. My, what, what I do is just happened. And I had my son. So I stopped doing TV because I decided that at 42 when I had him, I was like, I don't want to be a mum that's... And a lot of TV stuff was coming in. But yeah. I was like, I, I've waited so long for this baby um, that I want to nurture him and I want to be around. I don't want to be a mum that's doing a TV here and a do... There's nothing wrong with that. And if I'd have been what? 32, I would have done it. But at 42, with all the problems we had having him, yeah. it was like, he's mine and I'm going to stay here. So and be his mother, yeah. Yeah. And be his mother, yeah. Yeah, and I pulled away from TV for about six years, but still worked bits and pieces. Well, actually, what I ended up doing is X Factor and America's Got Talent for seven years. Um, right. Because they were short, sharp shows. Um, I could do three weeks hard-hitting rehearsal and then not have to work for the rest of the year. And you were doing the choreography for them? I was the creative director. director. Creative director, yeah. Yes, yeah, so the choreography and direction. So I started off with Britain's Got Talent for two years here which was not the TV show, it was the tour that went on. Right. Um, so I worked with the Alexander Burks and the JLSs and I did their tour. Um, and then America's Got Talent hired me. So another great gig, six years, every October, three weeks in Vegas. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'll take that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the thing is, it sounds like you've always had the courage to do the things you want. Yes. Or at least try, not knowing what the result will be, but knowing that if you don't try, things will remain the same. So, and, and, and Barry, I'm the first person, and I say whenever I'm directing a show or choreographing a show or just overseeing or whatever, it's nobody's perfect. Mm. Not one of us. And we all have our specialities. But if you make a mistake, you, and I instill this in my son, put your hand up, that's my bad. It was a really stinker idea or whatever it is, but put your hands up and it can be fixed. Yeah. 
Don't try and cover it over. Don't try and paste Don't it Don't try over. and bluff it over because then that just continues it. It continues. Yeah. And don't throw anybody else under the bus. <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. You yeah. just, you know, and when I work, I work with some of the best lighting designers, sound designers, and I say to them, you are really good at what you do and that's why that you're the top of your game and yeah. i'm really good at what i do i won't tell you where to put a speaker but i will tell you if it doesn't sound right yeah so you go and do your job because i think the sound and air you know i call it air vision yes is <laughs> international it's exactly. all over it's yeah. you know what i mean everybody knows if something doesn't sound good exactly <laughs> you don't have to be a, a specialist or a professional to know that's distorted no. or yes. <laughs> that's not clear yeah. so yeah. exactly yeah. so that's how i run every show i do and even to the show i'm doing now that's the that's the way i run it you know that's the way i sit the top of that pinnacle and then I have I'm not the I'm not at the top of the apex I have many people with me and it's a plateau and then we come down and it's from the top that you just push down and in that way everybody feels respected and therefore everybody does their best and, and again you know it's it's all about your attitude you see how you've got where you've got and are doing what you're doing because you realize you can't do it on your own. As you said, it's not about me being at the pinnacle. No. It's about the people who are supporting me yes. to do what I do. Yes. So, you know, you your speciality is what it is, but you can't be the lighting and the sound and the stage and, no. you know, but you need those people to do what they do, but it supports you to do yes. what you do. So it's nice that you give everybody involved that acknowledgement just like Cliff, <laughs> yes, <laughs> you know? Exactly. And so. when I did America, you know, I'm walking in as an English black woman into Caesar's Palace. No, the first one was the MGM, sorry. With a bunch of people, Americans have all worked together. We have literally seven days to put on a 90 minute show with a bunch of artists I have never met before in my life because all, they've all done America's Got Talent TV show. I'm walking in, I'm getting off my plane, the following day at 10 a.m., I'm walking in and I have nine artists in front of me. I have a magician, I have a singer, I have a couple of dancers, I have, I had a basketball team who did some sort of basketball <laughs> thing. And out of them, I had to make a 90 minute show. If I'd have walked in there trying to do the big I am, I would have failed. I yeah. walked in there and I said, right, first of all, I talked to all the crew. This doesn't happen without you. You need to get onto this stage and you do what you do. When I don't like something, I'll let you know. Other than that, if you don't hear from me, it's because I love it. Just keep going. Yeah, yeah. Same to the sound guys. And, and then I can deal with the artists and then I can concentrate on them and go, right. Do you know any more than 90 seconds of that song? No, ma'am. I'm sorry. I don't. OK, let's find another one. <laughs> that you do know more than 90 seconds of. Because <laughs> they've done a TV show where they've only done 90 seconds of each song. Yeah. That's not going to give me 90 minutes of a, a show. show. No. But, you know, I did that for seven years and it was brilliant. And, and so what were you padding it out with in between the artists? Were you having dancers or? Yes, I had dancers. Yeah. I, went, I, I went to LA, auditioned the dancers, took eight dancers with me every time. And then just pad it out with dancers. Yeah, and yeah, my yeah. host was Jerry Springer, who can pad oh. it out forever, let me tell you. <laughs> You're actually Hilarious. trying to drag him off stage going, Hello. we've only got 90 minutes. <laughs> I was like, Jerry, Jerry, come off now. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. So this all brings us to where you are now, which is, I have to say, guys, Mama Mia, the party, is it? Have I said it correctly? <laughs> Okay, I don't want to disrespect anybody. Mama Mia, the party, which is at the O2 in Greenwich. Now, let me tell you guys, if you want to do something different, if you want to do something special with a group of people, I'm telling you now, book it. Book it, because everybody loves ABBA. Everybody's <laughs> got a favorite. It crosses all age groups, but we'll get to that in a minute. It is 
outstanding. It is amazing. I'm running out of superlatives here, but literally, whatever you're expecting, it's not that. <laughs> whatever you're expecting this show to be, it's not that. I tell you, because we arrived, Angie Greaves and I, and they said, oh, you know, you've got to find the right moment to, to get to your seat. I'm like, well, what do you mean the right moment? Why can't we just walk to our seat? And as we walked into the arena, shall we say, we saw what was going on. There were people coming from all directions, all in the performance. So we were like, <laughs> trying to make the right run to get to our seat and not interrupt the performance. It is fantastic. So this was your concept, was it? No, so it had been on in um, Stockholm. So Bjorn okay. put it on in Stockholm first with a with a Swedish director about four years ago. Then right. he decided it's a smaller version, much smaller version. And he said, oh, you know, there was this thing about how they wanted to move it to London. So I had an interview with Bjorn and I was to be the Swedish director's assistant. Then within a month, I was the Swedish director's associate. Lovely. So then that's gone up around, has it? So that's that's gone right. And then we got to rehearsals. Bjorn said, can you be the Swedish director's co-director? He said, because what I'm seeing is he's fantastic in Sweden, but that's that pond. That's that pond. Yeah, you know what this needs to be. To translate London. to the... And for English London audience. and for what they're going to expect, for the money they're paying. And in internationally, because <gasps> fingers crossed, we're going to do it in Vegas next year and in Australia and in all those places. Fingers crossed. See why I had to get her quickly. OK, see why I had to get her quickly. Um, so it was it was almost like doing it from start because we had a new script written by Sandy Tosfik. And um, because the Swedish. Okay. Yeah, lovely Sandy. And the, yeah. the Swedish translate. So she wrote us a new book basically and then we changed a few of the songs put new, some new songs in so really it is it is a new a new idea it's a change right. of the old idea but um it's been an absolute joy to do an absolute joy and Bjorn is a genius a true genius um absolutely he has this drive and this passion that is so infectious that you will end up sitting with him going Oh, no, no, yes, we can do that. We can do that. Yes, whatever. <laughs> yeah, we, whatever you ask for, we'll make it work. We'll make it happen. Because um, he wouldn't ask if it wasn't possible. And okay. he's got that vision. I mean, well, I mean, we all know ABBA. We all know what ABBA stand for. And what was amazing is, as I said earlier, ABBA's appeal crosses generations. And at the Mamma Mia, the party at the O2, we were seeing audiences from late teens to, you know, elderly in wheelchair, one of who was relentlessly riding over my foot. She didn't care. She was just in the zone with the music. And I was being extremely patient, but that's another show. Anyway, <laughs> but, you know, it was just great to see this cross-generational thing and everybody just in it. And yeah. enjoying it together. It's not brain surgery. It's not rocket science. We're not taking anyone to the moon. We're saying, come in 6.30, show starts at 7.30, eat some food, drink some drinks, have a show that is immersed around you. You're walking into a Greek taverna, let's yeah. face it, and you are just going to have a good time. And when you come out of it, you go, that was fun. It wasn't deep. I didn't have to try and understand it I didn't have to think oh god I need to get my dictionary out what's going I just had a good evening I had a lady in last week it was her 90th birthday she had made her outfit for the night which was a little bit abaresque and she sat good there and she had tears in her eyes Barry it made my job I went round to see her and I was like, I hear it's your 19th birthday. She was like, oh, yes, dear, yes, dear. She said, I've been a fan forever. And I was like, oh, and she said, I made this. And then at the end of the show, I went up and I said, Betty, did you have a nice time? And she grabbed my hand 
and she had tears in her little eyes. She said, if I died tomorrow, I'd have the best, best, best time ever, and I will die happy. <laughs> to me, Makes it all worth it. Makes it all worth my, it. That's my job. You know, I, yeah. stand, I watch these people just having fun, and I go, tick, Stacey, thank you very much. I go home and I sleep well. Absolutely. I mean, it is phenomenal. I, I was dumbfounded. I mean, as I always say, Abba are my guilty pleasure. So when I had the opportunity to go, I was Angie was like, well, do you want to come? I said, of course I want to come. I love Abba with me. And we came out of that theater and stood up for a while and literally were going, what just happened? Uh, it was <laughs> pure joy. On the mezzanine, on the balcony, <laughs> and then suddenly someone's running from behind you, so you've got to do this and pull up. You know, it, you're totally immersed in the performance. You're a part of it. It's a brilliant concept. Thank brilliant you. And concept. you and Angie, pure joy for me seeing you two go, you can dance. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Not only sitting right at the front as we oh, were, but going on the pedestal in the middle. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Love Let it. Let me tell you, everybody, I took him and Angie up, Barry and Angie up, <laughs> straight onto that dance floor, and we were abbot out. Oh, absolutely brilliant night. So, I mean, it's running now in London for how long? Uh, we are booking through till next April, right. but the plan is we will just continue to extend as long as people come. Yeah. Um, and as I said, fingers crossed, um, next autumn, hopefully, an international date. Right. But, you know, you wonder things like, well, suppose it's continuously successful in London. How then do you bring in the international day? Do you then get an assistant choreographer? And, or yeah, how so I would leave for the six weeks that I leave um, or however long it would take me to put it on somewhere else. I have a dance captain in London, um, yeah. so they would look after the show and it would just be a diary thing. So we just make sure it's OK. Then I'd go and do it and then I come back. Brilliant. And well, I mean, all of the cast are gorgeous. <laughs> they're absolutely gorgeous. The women, the men, they're all yeah. gorgeous because not just facially, but the spirit that comes out of them while they're performing yeah. makes them even more appealing. But the short black girl, she Linda is, I saw her on a commercial the other day. Yes. I said, okay. I'm going, I've got a picture with her. <laughs> and everyone in the house is going, can you just calm down? <laughs> LJ well, She like is a real yeah. character in the performance, isn't yeah. she? She real. is. And she is a true professional. Absolutely. That voice? That voice. But she brings the joy and light and the bubble in this and she plays Debbie the chef and she's just amazing and it's not an easy show to cast because you can get some amazing singers and dancers and actors who can't be in that immersive place because right. they will be on stage and perform brilliantly yeah but these guys have to as you say have to be in amongst it so if somebody walks past them on the way to the toilet and they're in the middle of an acting scene and, and then, somebody yeah. says excuse me can you tell me where the toilet is they have to break tell that person where the toilet is and then go back in and they were actually doing that so yes. then at one stage you're not sure well are you performing or are you staff yes. or what because they they bring it in as being staff in a greek taverna that's the whole thing. From the moment they go downstairs and the moment the waiting staff start waiting, it is, I have to have a brief with them and say, guys, you are not just waiting in any restaurant. And it's not just, hello, how are you? If someone says, oh, it took me for ages to get here, you say to them, oh my goodness, did you get stuck on the boat that was coming from the other island? It's not, did you get stuck on the, um, on the Jubilee Jim. line? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we are in a world here. We are in a world. And in that world, there is nothing else except we're on the, we're on the island of Skopelos. Yes. And you see, that that is what makes it something that is quite special and individual. Because as you say, performing on stage, away from your audience, in front of your audience, you're not in it in that way. But then being in it, it's a, they have to be you have to in deal character. With them. You yeah. have to be in character all the time. Oh and my God, it took ages to get people. here. Oh, did you miss the boat? Or was there a delay yes. on the boat? And the person's probably going, huh? 
yeah. and then it clocks oh yeah. what's actually happening and you yeah. deal you have to deal with members of the public and sometimes members of the public when they've had a sherry or two can or three be or four <laughs> They kept coming, let me tell you. They can be. <laughs> That's why I was on the pinnacle in the game. Going, you can dance. <laughs> so they get a little bit like, you know, they go for it. Yeah. And Saturday nights, it it it, it goes. It, it's like one of the best clubs you've been to. So you mean, because we went, I think it was a Wednesday evening. Yes. And it was rampant. packed. But you mean Saturdays are even livelier? Oh, listen. The moment they start the first thank you for the music, sometimes on a Saturday night, they are up like they are at the end on the Wednesday when you saw it. That's it. I have to go back on a Saturday. I have have to go back on a Saturday night. It is too much fun. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. Well, it's just up and up and up for you, Stacey. And as you say, you know, I'm sure our paths have crossed, but not quite. As I said, we mentioned so many people, Paul Swaby, Production team, Steve Ajay, you know, well, Oki from Charles Organ's days, (laughs) you know, so our paths must have crossed, but it is an absolute honor and pleasure to talk to you. I know you're a busy girl. Thank you so much. You know you're a very busy girl. Thank you for (laughs) inviting me. My pleasure. I mean, I saw that, met you and thought, I have to bring her on to the In Conversation series because... I know she's just fabulous. I just looked at her and could tell she was fabulous. <laughs> the story was unfolding. I was like, yeah, definitely. She's got to be on the series. So oh, thank you thank so you. much. Lovely to talk oh, to you. Oh, doggy. What was that doggy? Yes, Lex, the husky. Lex. Oh. Come here. I've got three, <laughs> but not huskies. I've got three dogs. Oh, oh, really? Three dogs? Yes, I've got a husky. I'll send you a picture of him. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> my evil eye that's my eye I know you see he's sharp as a knife this girl sharp as a knife anyway lovely to talk to you, you too, all the too. best with the future and you know with whatever happens I'm going to try and come down on a Saturday night though, you to tell see me when show. and you can come and sit with me and be my guest I'll um yeah definitely because that sounds even more amazing than it was but um we will be in touch lovely to talk to you you're looking you amazing too. keep up the good job keep representing and just keep doing Stacey Haynes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Lots of love. All the Lots best. Of love.